Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. This week, we are looking uh, for October 6th at um, the uh, story of the golden calf, if we were to put it in just a little nutshell. It's uh, Exodus chapter 32, reading verses 1 through 14. Again, much has happened uh, since last week as we move quickly uh, through uh, the uh, story of Israel. And noteworthy here, we ended uh, last week with the Passover and what it means, what the Passover actually means, and how um, it captures uh, the faithfulness of God, uh, a reminder of what God has done for Israel. Um, And then to bring us to this scene of the golden calf, uh, Israel has wandered the wilderness of uh, they've been fed by God. They've been, uh, their thirst has been quenched by God. Israel has um, successfully been led uh, out of slavery, released from slavery. They've, uh, their enemies, the most powerful empire, has been destroyed. Um, they're wandered through the wilderness to actually reach the place where they are to do what they were released to do, which is to worship God. Now, we know the story. We've heard this in context before. We know that Moses is up on the mountain getting the instruction for how it is that they are to worship God. And I'm pausing on that word because I do know the Hebrew for this can be either translate worship or serve. And fast forward, the commandments, the 10 words that Moses is going to bring down from the mountains is not a 58-minute worship service. It truly is how to serve God in 24-7, 365 days a year. But the interesting thing of what this pause of this scene is is while God has been faithful, while God has shown up and shown out, while Moses has been the faithful uh, mediator of God's promise and God's presence, and now Moses is going up to get these words from God, the timing takes too long. And the God who promised to Adam and Eve, that humanity would bear it, God's image, it it was not soon enough for them when they were tempted with God's holding out on you. The God who promised Abram and Sarai that they would have great descendants, and it took too long for God to keep that promise. Now Moses has gone up on the mountain to get this word from God, and God, and that is taking too long. And so the people turn and ask for a quick intervention, a God that they can worship, a God that they can see. And so Aaron fulfills that by making them what will be one of the uh, breaking of the Ten Commandments they haven't received yet. They make an (laughs) image for them to worship. There's so much that has brought us to this moment, but moving quickly as this reading of the narrative lecture, lectionary allows us to do, allows us to linger in this moment and take the fullness of the parallels that have already been brought up for us. Yeah, that's really helpful, Joy. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that uh, comparing the the golden calf to Abraham and Sarah, uh, but that works, right? Like God's God gives a promise, God promises, uh, and then the people have to wait. (laughs) And so Abraham and Sarah have to wait for years and years. The people are only, you know, it's 40 days, right? It doesn't seem like that long, uh, especially compared to the 400 plus years, right, that they were uh, were enslaved. But yeah, but they're impatient. uh, and, And like you said, they want tangible evidence, right? They want 
something they can see and touch uh, uh, to uh, to worship. Uh, and so Aaron, uh, yeah, Aaron listens to them and casts an image uh, of a golden calf. I always, uh, when I teach this story to my seminary students, I, I emphasize the role of Moses here because Moses uh, here acts as a prophet, right? He, uh, a prophet, when we think of a prophet, we often think of someone who says, thus says the Lord and, you know, gives uh, uh, God's word to the people. And that's certainly what a prophet does. And that's what Moses does that uh, as well as a prophet. But here, Moses as prophet, and he's understood as the the uh, most important, the best prophet in Israel's history, um, as we learn later in De- Deuteronomy. Here, Moses's job as prophet is not to say so much, thus says the Lord, but to speak to God on behalf of the people, to stand in the gap, uh, to turn God's wrath away from the people. And so he does this with uh, this argument, right, that uh, the Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. And so Moses uh, says back to God uh, in verse 11, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty, right? I know I've said this probably before on this podcast, but it's like when a, a parent comes home and the other parent says, just wait till you hear what your son has done, right? Like Moses is turning it back on God. These aren't my people, God. These are your people. You brought them out of Egypt, you know, just reminding God of that. And then Moses says, uh, you know, what will the neighbors say? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them? Uh, And then he, he plays his trump card, right? Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, and then Moses quotes God's promise. Uh, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, all the way back to Genesis 15, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So God, uh, Moses uh, quotes God's promise back to God. And it's important to note that that promise binds God, right? That that God is faithful to God's promise. It's not just, it doesn't just, you know, bind Abraham and his family to God. It binds God, God's self, uh, to fulfill God's promise. And so that's the that's the linchpin of Moses's argument. And that's when God uh, says, or, or when the text says, and the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. So Uh, We've been talking about promise a lot. Uh, We've talked in these first five weeks of the narrative lectionary this year that promise is an overriding theme. Here's where we see the power of that promise uh, that that it that it binds God to these uh, to these people, even when they do stupid things like being becoming impatient and uh, and uh, and casting a golden calf to uh, to worship. You've hit on the phrase that I think is the key to it. And I think it occurs five times, which is the the one who brought us out of the land of Egypt. And uh, first the people use it, and they say it, it about Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, which is, of course, half true, and most heresies are half true. That's why they're good heresies, if they were just all lies. Uh, but so then um, Aaron casts... By the way, notice Aaron casts a singular calf and then says, tomorrow shall be a festival. And the word festival, we just had the festival that is um, authorized by God, Pesach. The word festival is a big word, hag, and uh, similar to the uh, Arabic hajj. Um, And so now they're making up their own festival, which is not authorized by God. And they're worshiping a calf as if it's Yahweh. Tomorrow shall be a festival to Yahweh. And Moses then says, this this calf is your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Even though it represents Yahweh, notice it's still wrong because um, back in Exodus 20, the first commandment is you shall have no other gods. You shall have no God other than me and you shall not worship a graven image, meaning of me. Uh, and then 
God even gets it wrong, right, Catherine, that you just said, so that um, you, this people whom you brought up in the land of Egypt, and isn't it interesting? So then, uh, then it occurs two more times. So when I teach Hebrew narrative, of, of, uh, of frequent devices, repetition with variation. And so you get that here. And it's only when Moses is arguing with God that Moses is the only one who actually says it fully true. All of the others are half true. Um, so it's wonderful. There's also a translation problem. And Catherine and I have argued about this before. Uh, the NRSV translates um, it, these are your gods. Elohim can be plural or singular. When referring to the singular God, it's it's a plural form, but it's translated as singular. And because there's only one calf and the festival is to Yahweh, uh, the Jewish translation of this um, translates it, this is your God, um, mm. which is how I also translate it. I don't think it makes sense the other way. What it is, of course, is later on in the story of uh, the northern kingdom setting up two images it's these are your gods, and so it's some. So it's probably that later verse has probably been substituted here for what once was a singular. Maybe, mm -hmm. but uh, but either way, I do think that most people, when they think of the story, think about why would the people worship a false god so quickly after the covenant and the Ten commandments. But I actually think it's. It's, it's a false image of the true God. And that, to me, is, I think, where it touches very closely on what we do. When we, emit, when we worship either the man Moses, we worship the human leader, because he's lost now and we're scared. Yeah. Uh, and, hey, I, I, I love to worship back in the days of nostalgia, you know, some previous seminary professors or president. Or we worship... The building, the golden calf, you know, um, the things that we think are God but really aren't. And I think that that to me is a powerful spiritual uh, thing to explore. And then, of course, Catherine uh, has already hit the uh, nail on the head about really the theological promise that God keeps. Ralph, I truly appreciate that because that is, I, I think, an invitation to dwell down on. Um, it's why I did that overview with uh, Abraham and Sarah, uh, Abraham doubting in 15, where we talk about this, you know, how long God, uh, Sarah does the same thing when she says, look, the custom of the way we do things in our culture says God's not going to give you your promise of descendants through me. So you go and take Hagar. And God actually confirms that the promise was given to Abraham and Sarah, even though Sarah in that portion of Scripture is the one that is impatient with God's timing. Um, throughout the story of the people of God to present day, we have this difficulty with waiting on God to do what God alone can do and take upon ourselves um, the attempts to fix where we think God has failed. And that takes us all the way back to that question or that language you gave us in terms of the reckoning of righteousness when we were talking about, obviously that has not left my mind, Ralph, um, when, when, when we were talking about Abraham. If, it, it, there's something powerful about asking it the way that you asked, um, because I'll ask it the way I ask all the time. What are we doing while we wait on God for God's next great move? <laughs> 